My name is Roberta Schaefer, and I'm the president of the Research Bureau. Uh, we'd really like to express our gratitude to uh, WPI for hosting today's forum and to bring greetings from uh, the university. Uh, please welcome Jeff Solomon, who's the executive vice president of WPI. Jeff? Thank you. Good morning. Um, very pleased that WPI is able to host this uh, very important discussion on improving Worcester's competitiveness for attracting development. I want to thank Roberta and the Research Bureau for uh, setting the session up and the panelists for taking time out of their very busy schedule to participate today. Um, economic development has been something that's really been integral to WPI's mission and founding for nearly 150 years. Uh, we were founded in part to provide a skilled workforce to support competitiveness in Worcester. And I think that our commitment to economic development and Worcester's growth and success has uh, never been stronger than today. And I just want to give a couple of examples of that. So this academic year, uh, we graduated over 1,500 students in uh, the mo very important STEM fields, uh, providing much needed engineers and scientists to support local and national businesses. Um, we have created a very robust technology transfer office here on campus uh, to help commercialize faculty research and <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that we really feel strongly about is industry and academia need to partner together to create jobs. Uh, in 2010, under Mark's leadership, we created a school of business to develop uh, innovative and entrepreneurial leaders, really with a lot of interaction with local business community. Uh, at Gateway Park, um, we've invested over $125 million, creating that mixed-use, uh, predominantly life science park to foster connections between WPI and, uh, and business. And the goal there is job creation and improving the uh, tax base in Worcester. Um, our first building uh, houses MBI, and I saw Kevin O'Sullivan here, uh, business, you know, a life sciences incubator that helps spawn companies. And we've also been able to use some of our own lab space in that building uh, to help when uh, uh, some companies got a little bit big, like Blue Sky, and we're also able to help incubate uh, RxI a few years ago. Um, the second building at Gateway Park is home to a new venture at WPI known as the uh, Biomanufacturing Education and Training Center, and it's providing customized workforce uh, development solutions to businesses. Uh, we understand there's a growing need in this area and in Massachusetts for trained workforce in the life sciences, and this venture is helping us uh, provide that. And I do want to make a comment or two on Gateway Park because this is something that WPI alone can't and could not be able to do. It required a very significant effort from a number of people. I see Tim over here. Uh, Tim has been a wonderful partner representing the city on master planning and permitting aspects of the park. Um, we benefited greatly from federal, state, and local support for such things as infrastructure improvements, low-cost loans, tax credits, uh, grants for cleanup and construction. There's been a significant uh, investment by the private sector, uh, O'Connell Development Group, in building the uh, second building down there. So absent this type of level of commitment from all different parts of local, government, private, public, I just don't think we'd be able to be as successful there. So um, I hope that this uh, is a good segue into some of the things that the panel will be discussing and uh, really looking forward to the discussion this morning. So thank you and welcome. Roberta. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and again, thank you very much for hosting this in this uh, lovely building. Um, today's program is part of the Research Bureau's Francis Harrington Forums on Municipal Government. And along with all of our 2013 events, it's sponsored by Commerce Bank, uh, and who is also, once again, the presenting sponsor for our annual meeting. Thank you, Brian, uh, and your team. Um, special thanks also to Polar Beverages, this year's leadership sponsor, uh, Mike Mulrain, our current chairman and CFO of Polar. Thank you. Um, today's forum is also sponsored by Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Um, and since opening an office in Worcester, Harvard Pilgrim has become very active in the community, supporting not only the Research Bureau, but many other worthy organizations and events around Worcester. Um, Research Bureau also wishes to express its appreciation to the Telegram and Gazette for advertising today's event. And please be sure to visit our website where you can read uh, the Research Bureau's reports, announcements, and upcoming events, and so on. And I just want to call your attention to a report that we just issued today, which is part of our new series, Worcester by the Numbers, 
Um, this one provides data on Worcester's economy and jobs, a topic very much related to today's discussion. Uh, the next Research Bureau event will be our 28th annual meeting, which will take place at 4.30 p.m. at the DCU Center on June 5th. Our featured speaker is Harvard economist Professor Edward Glazer. Uh, the, the, please uh, send in your RSVP uh, by uh, the end of this week, and for more information, please call the Bureau. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, moderator for today's program, Tim McGurthy, who is eminently qualified to serve as the moderator. Uh, Tim is the Chief Development Officer for the City uh, of Worcester uh, and also the Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Worcester Redevelopment Authority. He's a member of the City Manager's Cabinet and oversees Worcester's planning, economic development, and workforce development activities. Prior to his work in Worcester, Tim was the Director of Policy for the Boston Redevelopment Authority, Boston's Planning and Economic Development Agency. He's a graduate of the College of William and Mary and holds a master's degree in government from Johns Hopkins University and a master in public policy and urban planning from the Kennedy School at Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming uh, Tim to serve as the moderator today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Roberta. And I want to thank the Research Bureau for putting out this forum. Um, you know, the Research Bureau does a fantastic job of taking those issues that are percolating in the background and putting them in front of us to, to discuss, address, and really have a, a community-wide conversation about where we are and where we're headed. So thanks to Roberta and Jean and the team uh, for really keeping those, keeping those issues at the forefront and providing a place for real discussion. And I want to thank Jeff and WPI. Uh, WPI has been an incredible partner to the city throughout our efforts on economic development and broad-based community growth. Um, Gateway Park is just one example of WPI's efforts within the community. So it's, it's a, a great partnership that we have, and we appreciate the, the hosting here. Um, Worcester is moving forward. As everyone sees, the development is underway throughout the city. We have cranes in the sky. We have buildings coming down. We have buildings going up. We have buildings being renovated. But for us, the question has been, are we competing? We're succeeding. We're succeeding locally. We're creating opportunities here within the city. We're seeing change and growth within the city. But are we competing broadly? Are we drawing in new from the outside? Are we making success happen? Are we building on that success with new investment and new money coming into the community? And so we're very lucky to have what I think is probably the best panel we could possibly have around the region, throughout New England, to talk about this issue. Um, the experts, not just from a real estate side where we've seen great success, but from a business side, what is it that makes businesses choose and, and decide on where they locate and how they expand, and from new entrepreneurial efforts. Uh, how do ideas come to fruition and find places to take root and grow? And so I'm excited to hear from the panel and see what they have to say, um, how we can make Worcester compete, not just succeed, but compete broadly across the region. Um, our challenge has always been, how do we get the word out? How do we make Worcester a force, not just within central Massachusetts, but beyond? How do we leverage? One of the efforts we've been taking is a coordinated effort, taking the various entities that work together here with, within Worcester to try to make sure we partner and collaborate and grow our efforts in a, in a leveraged way, in a partnered way, and that's through the Economic Development Coordinating Council. We're in many ways nascent in our approach. We're at the beginning efforts of looking what each organization, the city of Worcester, mass biomedical initiatives, uh, Worcester Business Development Corporation and the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce, what each of us does, how we go about it, and how we work together to promote those activities. So for us, and I see different representatives from those various groups here within the, the hall today, it's a learning experience for us to hear what people have to say and how we should go forward as a team. We know we can be competitive. We have a large educated population. We have a growing 40% of our residents between the ages of 25 and 34 have a bachelor's degree or higher. Incredible statistics about the value of Worcester itself and Worcester's population. We have our colleges, our renowned colleges. WPI is but one example of the academic wealth here within the city. We have a low cost of living, a high quality of life, all those things that make for a great community and a great ability to compete. 
So the question for the panel is, should we compete? How do we compete? And if so, who are we competing against? So with that, I'll turn it over to the panel to hear from them. Our first panelist will be Dan O'Connell. Uh, Dan is president and CEO of the Massachusetts Competitor Partnership, a public policy group made up of 15 CEOs of the largest private employers in Massachusetts, focused on job creation and competitiveness in Massachusetts. This isn't just a question Worcester is asking, this is a question Massachusetts is asking, is how does Massachusetts become more competitive? And Dan is a leader in that effort here. Prior to MAPC, Dan served as the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development for the Commonwealth from 2007 to 2009. He's had an extensive career in real estate. My first experience with Dan was when I worked at the BRA. He was working for Spalding and Sly on the development of the Fan Pier, an incredibly complex project, an incredibly long-term effort. If you think City Square was bad, you should have seen Fan Pier and all the different stages it went through. Um, while at Spalding and Sly, he represented the Pritzker family on Fan Pier, 3 million square feet. Uh, he represented as a developer for the Mellon family on 45 acre, 5 million square foot North Point in Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston. Uh, he also served as development manager for the Puerto Rico Convention Center Authority in San Juan. He was executive director of the Mass Industrial Finance Agency, now Mass Development, a key player in development here within the city of Worcester. Uh, and he was a real estate attorney with the attorney in the Boston and Washington firm of Gadsby and Hanna, uh, where he served as managing partner. Uh, and importantly, with everything going on, Dan was the first chief of staff with Congressman Ed Markey. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan to talk about competitiveness and real estate. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to the Research Bureau and our sponsors for uh, holding this forum today and inviting me uh, to Worcester. Uh, when I served as secretary, some of my most rewarding days were spent here uh, working on projects like City Square, and, uh, and um, I found it to be a community that worked together, worked together effectively, the business community, the ac academic community, and government. So I'm going to talk about enhancing competition here. It's a uh, focal point of the effort of my group, a little more about mass competitive partnership, CEOs of 15 of the largest employers, about 130,000 jobs in the state, 700,000 jobs worldwide. EMC, Joe Tucci is one that has uh, quite a presence in this part of the state. We have um, Mass Mutual from Springfield. We uh, are a statewide organization. We try not to be Boston-centric, uh, and I think we're successful a lot of the time in doing that. And so we want to see prosperity throughout the state, job creation, throughout the state, and we've been working on what are our strengths, how, what do we sell uh, as we go around the world. I was in Ireland last week with the governor and Senate president, uh, and one of the things we sell around the world is our talent, uh, our phenomenal educational institutions, and the talent they produce. Um, many of those individuals stay in the state, stay in the region, others go back to their home countries, so we've got this alumni network all around the world. And by connecting with them, I think we can expose our strengths to world markets as well. Um, I was with uh, Larry Summers, a former Treasury Secretary and former President of Harvard at the boardroom of the Federal Reserve Bank. And Larry was giving his uh, prognostications about the future of Massachusetts statewide again, uh, not Boston focused. And Larry was pretty optimistic, and Larry's not always optimistic, so I was uh, pleased to see this. And he made a comment that really hit home with me. Um, he said, if Boston and Cambridge were to fall into the sea, and with global warming, it well might happen, uh, we would still be one of the great university and research centers of the world here in Massachusetts. And Larry was talking about Worcester when he talked about that. Thirteen colleges and universities, uh, all turning out top-notch graduates, all integrating very effectively, I think, into the business community. I think that is one of our key strengths. Uh, in 07, when I was working for the governor, I had the uh, pleasure to go along to uh, a trip to China, the first trade mission the governor took to Beijing and Shanghai. And Craig Mello uh, from uh, UMass Medical uh, was with us uh, on that trip. I sat next to Craig on the plane. I've never had a long flight go so quickly. Talk about a, not only a bright scientist, but a true uh, 
man of many interests. Uh, and we, we got to Beijing and we went to Tsinghua University. Uh, uh, and Greg was scheduled to give a lecture there uh, on the second day of the trip. And about four hours before he was scheduled to the, give the lecture, I walked by a classroom which was packed. Um, people sitting on the steps, standing room only. And I said, is someone else famous going to be here today to give a lecture? And they said, no, they wanted to get a seat for Craig's le lecture. Four hours before the time he was going to uh, issue it. Well, there's an emissary to the world from Worcester and someone who has incredible respect. And it builds on the uh, great biotech center, um, you know, Kevin O'Sullivan's work uh, in putting Worcester on the map. When I was back at the Mass Industrial Finance Agency, uh, I'm proud to say we uh, provided one of the first million dollar grants to get the biotech research facility off the ground here. And uh, the strength of that facility will continue to grow in Worcester. Uh, I think that as you look at the future, uh, look again to our strengths. Um, and it goes not only from the university level, but I, I see that um, Dr. Gail Carberry is here. Uh, I visited Kutsigamon. It is one of the most vital uh, and active of the community colleges. I've visited most all of them around the state at this point. She is using those buildings seven days a week, uh, 16 hours a day. The largest graduating class in history is about to graduate tomorrow. Uh, and uh, the campus is opening a downtown location for healthcare careers to be better in sync with Mass College of Pharmacy and, and Worcester State. That level of cooperation, that, that spirit of cooperation, serves the area very, very well. Uh, I think uh, that Worcester is well positioned uh, to hold on to the millennials. And the key is to hold on to the graduates, to the ones where people we educate, not just in the state, but regionally within the state. Uh, although housing costs have come up uh, as prosperity has uh, spread throughout the Central Mass area, they're still a relative bargain. Uh, and I think that the opportunity to keep these individuals who don't want to own a car, who like public transportation, uh, the expanded rail routes and the shorter times with the CSX acquisition from Worcester to Boston. Everything that Boston offers is available, and yet you can go home to a quieter, saner, uh, happier place. Uh, in 2012, Forbes mag magazine rated Worcester as the second happiest place to work in the country. Uh, and I think that's all about quality of life uh, and spirit of the, of the individuals who live here. I am a big supporter of, and was when I was secretary, the creative economy. Uh, I think arts and culture are what uh, makes a life worth living in our commonwealth, and we are a leader in that area, and Worcester is a leader within the commonwealth. Uh, you have an incredible uh, history of, uh, of giving, both corporate and individual. The Higgins family is a representative of that. This was my home, by the way. I turned it over to the Higgins at one point. <laughs> uh, um, and I think that history of uh, arts and culture and uh, the concerts that are going on, the Hanover Theater um, restoration and all the activities that happen there, that's all a, uh, a magnet for the talent that is the key to Worcester's future and our state's future. Yesterday, I was with Tom Glynn, who's the new CEO of Massport. He's asked me to serve on an advisory group as Massport looks forward uh, over the next 20 years as to what its um, uh, future will be and how it can better serve the economy of the Commonwealth. And Worcester Airport was a key a topic of conversation in that meeting yesterday. Um, I worked at Massport during the Weld administration, one of my uh, forays into government before I retreated back to the private sector again. Uh, and um, that was the time when Massport first became involved with uh, the facility. Uh, it's an excellent facility, great terminal. Uh, the um, controls, the uh, radar, and all the uh, key elements of bringing planes in and out have been upgraded. The access issues are still a challenge, as we all know, but I think we can move toward a solution there. 
and I met with recently with Tom, with the president of JetBlue, and they are very excited of their, about their uh, first two flights that will be commencing, and I think there's a very good chance that we'll see an expansion of JetBlue and drawing others uh, to the airport. And I know that Tom Glynn and the board at Massport, which includes a couple of people from Worcester, uh, as you're aware, uh, is going to be clearly focused on that effort. I, I'd like to wind up my comments and uh, leave some time for my colleagues and questions with maybe a little bit of tough love. So I've been very positive about the assets you have here, uh, the way that your academic business and government communities work effectively together. But I think there's something holding Worcester back. Um, there's a little bit of a chip on the shoulder, uh, a little bit of Boston did it to us once again, uh, and we've been ignored once again. Uh, and all I would say to that is forget about it. Uh, I think that we need to celebrate the strengths. And uh, yes, there have been uh, slights in the past. Uh, yes, the city of Worcester and Central Mass has had to fight uh, for its fair share of uh, state dollars, but you have fought very effectively during the two terms of the Patrick Murray administration for those dollars. You are doing very well. Uh, I received many calls from Lieutenant Governor Murray when I was Secretary of Economic Development. They were all about Worcester. Uh, uh, and so maybe one of the best ways to become more competitive is to hire Tim Murray to be head of the chamber. Uh, and uh, you've made that good move already. Uh, but I'd urge you to um, be more forward-looking, be more optimistic, be more enthusiastic about your wins. Uh, don't dwell on the losses. Uh, it really is all about building on your strengths, and you, you have some excellent strengths, from manufacturing to from the biotechnology core here, which is uh, phenomenal, uh, to the insurance financial services side of it, and always, always back to your great colleges and universities. Because in Massachusetts, we'll never have the cheapest energy. Uh, we'll never have the best weather, as we see today. But we do have top talent. And if we integrate effectively those colleges and universities with the business community, the future is bright for Worcester and the entire state. Thank you. <laughs> Just like a Bostonian, we invite him out here and he tells us to get over it, you know? <laughs> See if we extend that invite again. Uh, no, thank you, Dan. Um, our next speaker is David Begelford, who is the head of NAOP, Massachusetts. And I, as I was sitting there, I realized David was also involved in FanPeer in many ways. Um, the time of that project, the big debate was the role of the public sector and the private sector. And David was a staunch advocate for the public's need to invest in infrastructure necessary to make development grow. And that, I think, basically led to the District Improvement Financing Program, which is what we used here in Worcester to make City Square happen. So David's been a part of that project, too. Um, NAOP Massachusetts is a commercial real estate development association representing the industry through its legislative affairs, educational programs, and its continual outreach into the critical issues of business development. I, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say David is probably the most important advocate for the real estate industry here in Massachusetts. You don't see anyone more involved and more present in the discussions over the, the future of construction, the re future of real estate, ex other than David. Um, NAOP represents the interests of companies involved with the development, investment, and ownership of office, industrial, retail, mixed use, and institutional properties. He serves on the board of a number of civic and charitable organizations and on many state regulatory and policy advisory committees. Previously, he was the president of the Ivor Company, a commercial real estate development company that built office and R&D properties in Eastern Mass. So we're pleased to have David come here, as long as he doesn't tell us to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I never like following Dan. <laughs> it's worse, though, to follow the governor. That is, I think, clearly a, a, an issue. Um, again, I want to thank the, the Research Bureau for uh, having me and all of you to be here. Uh, it's nice to be back to, uh, to my roots. I went to uh, Clark University, just down the street, a small college down there. 
And, uh, and so that was a number of years ago, and uh, it was a direct route uh, from my uh, undergraduate degree in uh, organic chemistry and philosophy um, that uh, soon led me to my job today, so I just want to uh, mention that. <laughs> Make sure uh, you tell your kids uh, they can plan all they want, but you never know where life takes you. Um, also, I very appreciate the, uh, the call out for, uh, uh, for our work uh, that we do at NAOP. Um, the DIF, which um, uh, we actually uh, wrote the law and uh, helped get it passed, um, so you can either thank or, uh, or berate me for uh, having that tool. We'll see how that all works out in the end. But I think it was a very effective tool. And again, it shows that you need to have you know, public policy match up with the demands and the needs of the business community. Um, and where they do, uh, you get results. And I think that's very key. Um, I guess the, the concept has always been traditionally, um, you know, from the movie, uh, if you build it, they will come. Uh, the concept is if we can, you know, get some construction going, if we can build some office buildings, if we can get some uh, R&D facilities, uh, we will be able to get those businesses to come wherever it is, whether it's here or any other across the country. And um, I'm here to say that I don't believe that that's the case. Um, not to say that you don't need buildings, but today it really comes down to the demand side of the equation. It, it clearly is on the demand side. You need to be able to have the businesses. You need to have the growth. You need to have the uh, uh, ingenuity that you uh, sort, of, sort of nourish around here. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, I'm going to talk about real estate, but I really feel that I need to talk about sort of starting off where Dan was finishing, and that is the whole issue about uh, the skilled workforce. Uh, because I believe that uh, the skilled talent today is sort of the honey for the bees. Um, and I was talking before uh, the program started, and when you go back in time for Worcester, um, a lot of the schools that developed here, like WPI, were really servicing the manufacturing sector that was the roots you know, of, of Worcester. Uh, this was our true collaboration. And I think that's the model of the past that we need to take another look at and have going forward to the future. I think it is going to be the very key, and, and certainly Worcester is well positioned with the colleges and universities that it has, what I do think, though, is that there is not the kind of collaboration that we could have. I don't think that we necessarily have, and I think WBI might be you know, an exception to the rule to some degree, but if you take a look at the colleges and universities here, as well across the, the, the state, um, other than like MIT, and maybe you look at some Northeastern, certainly MIT is the gold standard, where you really have a university that is producing new concepts, new jobs, the talent. Um, it is really part of the economic development engine. And I think that we need to get that tie between the colleges and universities and economic development, which then gets you back to the whole issue of talent and the skills that are necessary for the businesses today. So I, I do think that one of the key things is to be focusing on um, the existing business demand that you have. Um, it's always more difficult to, to attract something new as opposed to nourish and, and try to grow what you have here. Uh, and what we're finding out is that, which is a real surprise to me, that in an economy that is doing better than most others uh, around the country, um, we still have uh, unemployment and unemployment across the board, uh, different age group, demographics, ed uh, education, yet along with that, we have businesses that have jobs that are open that they cannot get filled. And we're not talking about you know, the top, top, top levels and it's very hard to find you know, that uh, PhD with three different degrees and whatever. We're talking across the board from manufacturing skills, uh, which are now much more high tech, all the way up to you know, the higher, higher levels. So there is still a mismatch with our talent that we have here and the jobs that are out there. And I think one of the things that I would love to leave you with here is that there needs to be a lot more collaboration with the business community and the universities and colleges that we have here. Um, I know the college universities today are not just sitting in the ivory tower and saying, you know, it's important that we get people out there who are well-rounded, who have good interests and degrees, and it's wonderful. But the bottom line is, especially with an education that's costing over $200,000, there's certain expectation that when you come out, you're going to have a job. And I think there needs to be a little bit more of that uh, collaboration. And I think collaboration is going to be an important uh, word uh, today that we talk about. So I want to go also beyond that and talk about uh, some collaboration, some suggestions. I think regionally, 
you need to be more collaborative. I think that uh, Worcester is, is, is a lot to sell here, um, but I think the best way to sell Worcester is to sell the region, um, because there's an awful lot that can be uh, value added by not just Worcester, but also the surrounding cities and towns. And I think you need to take a look at it in that way. Um, I think that, again, working on your strengths, which are here, uh, with the higher ed, with the sort of life sciences, uh, you have good solid infrastructure as far as lower cost, there's always those opportunities. But again, I think what it's gonna come into is taking a look at those resources that you do have and trying to um, put, a little, put them on steroids a bit. Um, in Worcester itself, and I did a little bit of uh, surveying of people who have worked uh, in, in the area, who have come here, and some of the comments that I've had that come out of there is that um, there seems to be more of a, a, a need of a more of a, a important one point of contact, a, uh, someone you go to who can be a decision maker. It's a little bit diverse, a little dispersed that is, uh, on the decision making powers. Um, as far as um, a number of the economic development players, I understand that there's a coordinating council that's forming up. One of the criticisms I heard is you have a lot of organizations here, but there isn't the collaboration, so you're not sure where to go. It's a little muddled. And I think that's gonna be important for you to go, uh, to have some clarity here amongst the groups that are working towards the same end but also I think you're gonna to need to really have someone you can go to, um, one person who can be able to walk you through and help you get through the whole process as you go through this. Um, so partnerships, I think, as I said, are gonna be a, an important element here. And of all the partnerships, as I mentioned, I think the universities, because you have such a concentration here, are the keys uh, to, to work with going forward. So I think also, besides the idea of taking a look and matching up the job training, um, you know, with you know, the, the, the college, uh, with the businesses that are here, um, I think you also have opportunities here of being able to grow uh, licensing opportunities, uh, ideas that can come out of the college universities here and give a little bit more of some assistance. Um, when I went on the trade mission, we we're talking about trade missions with the governor, I went to, to Israel. And if you ever want to take a look where they have mastered the idea of, of, of ideas and licensing, um, the state of Israel gets involved in there and really tries to enable each college and university that's there, not just at the Technion, which is the MIT of, of Israel, but all of them, and sort of say, ideas are going to spring out of, out of these places. Let's figure out how we can be able to take these and actually work these into jobs, into new businesses, into new ideas. And to do that, you really need to have someone there who understands that process of working on the business side, but also working on the university side. It's not an automatic match. Um, there are different, uh, I'm not quite sure it's a right brain, left brain thing, but there certainly are different ways of looking at the world. You need to somehow bridge that and bring them together. And I think of all the places in the state, this is one of the places where you can really do that and accomplish it well. Because as you develop a strong talent base in particular industries, uh, as I mentioned before to someone, it used to be you, you, you move your business close to the pillow of the CEO, CEO. Right now, you move your business where you can have a steady flow of talent for your particular business. And the poster child I always like to talk about is Meditech. Um, Meditech that moved down towards Fall River. And they went there because, not just there was a piece of land, there's a lot of land out everywhere, but because of the relationship of the community college and, uh, and UMass Dartmouth, that committed themselves to being able to produce kind of skills that were very specific and appropriate to Meditech, uh, that gave them the confidence to being able to open up facilities there and grow their business. You had that same kind of opportunity. Um, as I said, the honey is those skilled talents which you have here. Some of them are you gonna lose, some of them are you gonna keep. And um, a point I do wanna make out, uh, mention that someone else mentioned about Worcester and that is you have all these students here and yet there's no place for them to sort of get together, the cross-fertilization. There's no place in the city where you see them all getting, a, a, coming in, um, which the benefit of that is when you have that happening, you have some innovative kinds of uses that get created. You have uh, a draw for the young people to stay here. Um, it's good to be in a happy town, that's good, but for people who are in their 20s, they're looking for a little bit more than the quiet happiness. Uh, they're looking for some action. <laughs> they're looking for some activity. Again, you have that opportunity with that whole base to try to strategically think of how do you get people from WPI and Assumption and, and Clark and, and have a place where they can gravitate and get together. And that cross-fertilization is a healthy one. 
Uh, I'm going to finish off because I do want to, I know we want to move to Q and A's. Um, the economics of development, uh, just basically, the cost of develop here, a building, an office building here versus built Boston is pretty much the same. I mean, maybe a little difference in all that. The rents in Boston are probably at least twice what they are right now. Yet you're not building any speculative bo uh, uh, buildings in Boston for office. It's all built to suit. The rents are yet still not high enough. So if they're not high enough in Boston, okay, they're certainly not high enough here for you to go ahead and say, if we build it, they're going to come. You need to have a reason why a company needs to be here. It has to be uniquely set here in a facility that isn't available for them if you're going to go ahead and build it. And you're going to probably have to work out a heck of a lot of, of, of the bells and whistles financially um, to be able to try to lower some of those costs so when you do have that interest, you can be somewhat competitive. So it is not an easy process, to say the least. Um, but the idea that you can just sort of get someone here who's willing to build uh, is not the answer. The key here is to have the demand from the tenants that are going to be able to pay the rent that are going to allow you to build. And I think that's where it comes in. And lastly, I'm going to mention, because I would be a disservice um, to my industry, to mention one of the pediments that I was talked about uh, when I spoke to people, and that is uh, tax rate here for commercial property is just too high. And you're going to have to work on that. You're going to have to deal with that. Because that is another, and all these things added together make it much more difficult for someone who does want to come here and want to you know, put their, their, their roots down to do that. So I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to uh, do the Q&A, and uh, I want to thank you very much for having me here, and uh, we look forward to uh, moving forward. Thanks, David. Ending on a tax rate is definitely a high, so. <laughs> uh, I do want to point out one thing as, as we turn to our next speaker that David said, which is the comment about the licensing opportunities, and that's something that I think Worcester has been, in Worcester's colleges and universities have been embracing more and more is the opportunities inherent in the research going on. Um, I was at an event last night at UMass Medical School where we were hosting with the medical school the uh, medical device group which is the statewide organization of those involved in medical, uh, medical development group, which is a statewide organization of those involved with medical devices primarily. Um, but one of the comments, and uh, Jim Leary is here from UMass Medical School, that was made is that UMass, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, has about $45 million annually in licensing that starts to come out. So that's an incredible figure. And that's basically turning the ideas circulating here within the Worcester research arm into on the ground development opportunities. And, and our next topic and our next speaker is Mark Rice from uh, WPI School of Business, the Dean of the WPI School of Business, who's gonna talk about how we grow ideas into companies or how we grow businesses here within the city. Um, as mentioned, Mark is Dean of WPI School of Business. He's the Harry G. Stoddard Endowed Professor in Management, a uh, recent transplant from Albany, New York, Rensselaer. Uh, his research on corporate innovation and entrepreneurship has been published in numerous acclaimed academic and practitioner journals. He's co-author of Radical Innovation, How Mature Companies Can Outsmart Upstarts, published by Harvard Business Press. He's in high demand for consulting, speaking, and training services for a wide range of technology investive, uh, intensive companies, including EMC, Fidelity, IBM, Intel, and many others. Uh, here in WPI, a key critical element he's brought forward is the, the push to create uh, research on incubation of new ventures and startups and uh, establish enterprise connecting teaching to the practice uh, here within the economy. So with that, Dean Rice. Good morning. So you uh, have heard that I'm the dean here, but I want to start as a professor and uh, start with a pop quiz. I'm prim primarily going to focus on the concept of an innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. So when you he hear that uh, series of words, the pop quiz question is, what regions come to your mind as sort of the leading innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems in the United States? Silicon Valley, Research Triangle, Kendall Square. Absolutely, Route 128, Kendall Square, Cambridge. What would be third? What would be fourth? Can you get to the fourth? Raleigh. Raleigh that was Research Triangle. Yes. Any any others? 
Hey, there we go. What's that? <laughs> well, that's what I'm going to talk about, Roberta. Thank you. Actually, you know, we, those are the, probably the big three people think of, and then, then there are maybe the fourth, fifth, and sixth. But the question is, how can Worcester find its own way to being an innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem? So I'm going to reflect on two publications. One was a publication in Harvard Business Review by Gary Hamill, and the title of the article was Bringing Silicon Valley Inside. Now, he was talking about how you bring Silicon Valley inside companies. I'm going to talk about how do you bring Silicon Valley inside Worcester, okay? And the second I'm going to talk about is a, a book I co-edited co and co-authored uh, entitled University-Based Entrepreneurship Ecosystems, Global Practices. And we looked at four uh, university-based entrepreneurship ecosystems around the world. Did I say four or six? Sorry, I can count. Uh, and that had all been going for about 20 or 30 years. So in the United States, we had an East Coast one centered on Babson, that's where I was at the time. Uh, middle of the country was University of Texas at Austin. Austin would be in the fourth, fifth, and sixth of the entrepreneurship ecosystems. And then uh, University of Southern California on the West Coast. And internationally, we looked at Monterey Tech, uh, representing Latin America, uh, that's in Mexico, uh, EM Lyon in France, and National University of Singapore in Asia. And I'm going to end my talk about sort of the seven key success factors we saw in how these six uh, entrepreneurship ecosystems uh, evolved and then became successful. But back to the article, Bringing Silicon Valley Inside. So the key thing I took away from that that I want to share with you is uh, Gary Hamill's view that Silicon Valley and other regions like it have sort of three fundamental elements. The first would be ideas, intellectual property, technology. It's the something that you're going to offer to customers that they're going to uh, value more than their current alternatives and therefore switch to those new ideas, those new technologies. At the end of the day, entrepreneurship starts with opportunity. Opportunity is a match between a need in the marketplace and something that the entrepreneur offers. And obviously, it has to be better than what the customer is currently using. So that's the starting point for entrepreneurship. And any uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem is going to have a source of uh, innovative ideas and intellectual property and technology. The second is investment capital. Yes, many, many small businesses uh, bootstrap, but truly the ones that grow quickly and create a lot of jobs tend to uh, require investment capital to get them through the startup and fast growth periods. And third, and third because it's most important, is a pool of entrepreneurial talent. Lots of other kinds of talent is important too, but you'll see why the entrepreneurial talent is the key. So here would be my assessment of Worcester. I don't think we have any shortage of ideas, intellectual property, and technology. If you just start looking at the great universities that are here, uh, you know, particularly on the technical side, you'd say WPI and UMass Medical, tremendous source of uh, ideas for growing new industries. We don't have a shortage of investment capital. Yes, we might like a little more local seed capital, but look, if there's a, a promising idea here in Worcester, believe me, I've got a Rolodex of a uh, venture capitalist in Boston who would come out here in a nanosecond. It's a short drive. So the real constraining factor, frankly, is the pool of entrepreneurial talent. This is an incredibly powerful old industrial city. Uh, old industries that have been established for a long period of time usually are not the source of the next generation of entrepreneurs. So uh, if there's a sort of a prescription here, it would be the following. We need to figure out how to establish in Worcester a supportive, appealing, compelling, uh, entrepreneurial culture and environment that will enhance the attractiveness of Worcester to attract and to keep entrepreneurial talent. I think that ties exactly to the point you were making. You know, if you're looking at the universities here and we've got this incredible talent pool, you know, what's going to get them to come together? What's going to get them to want to stay here in Worcester as opposed to taking the great job someplace else? And then also, I would say, how do we inspire those entrepreneurs who already have strong ties to Worcester 
either to stay or to come back. And I think that applies particularly to the students and alumni of our universities. You know, they had life-changing experiences here, four, years of the, four of the best years of their lives. And if the opportunities were here, if the environment was here, if the culture was here to encourage them to start their businesses here, they'd do it in Worcester as opposed to going to California and doing it in Silicon Valley or paying the high cost of doing it in Cambridge. So now let me switch to this, uh, the seven key success factors for entrepreneurship ecosystems. Uh, it shows up in the last chapter of our book. The first one, and this is going to echo a lot of the things you've heard already, it starts with leadership. And we're going to start with senior leadership, and that means the leaders in the business community, in government, and in, and in academia. And how do those leaders come together, work together, so that you end up getting the leverage of that collaboration and that cooperation. The second is you also need the strong leadership at the programmatic level. So uh, when you look at ecosystems, there's a whole collection of things that have to happen. And there are leaders in each of those uh, organizations. So whether it's an incubator or it's a venture forum or it's uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you need leaders at, at that level as well. The third is you got to be in it for the long haul. This is not a one or two or two, two or three year kind of activity. By the way, it's not centuries. It is decades though. You know, when we looked at these uh, six case studies around the world, each of them had been evolving their ecosystems over a 20 to 30 year period of time. Success factor four, the commitment of substantial financial resources. Here I'm not talking about investment capital for the companies. I'm talking about the investment of the community in this entrepreneurship ecosystem, the infrastructure that supports those entrepreneurs. By the way, at the end of the day, no matter what you do, uh, entrepreneurship is a low probability of success activity. Talk to your venture capital buddies. You know, they look at 100 deals to invest in one. If they have a portfolio of 10, they're lucky if one or two of them really makes it. So it's a, it's a one in a thousand kind of thing. By the way, lots of, lots of them will uh, survive and be successful small businesses, but not give a big return to the venture capitalists. So it's not about they all fail, it's about the level of success they achieve. But the point here is, if you have the infrastructure to support the entrepreneurs, what you're really doing is uh, increasing their probability of success. And every little bit of improvement in that uh, produces a big return on investment. Uh, the fifth factor is a continuing uh, commitment to innovation. The world's changing very fast. You can't put something in place today and expect it's going to uh, be useful for the next two decades. You have to continue to innovate and continue to invest. Sixth factor, an appropriate organizational infrastructure. And in the book, we have a table of, I don't know, about 20 different elements of an entrepreneurship ecosystem. And the amazing part was in all six of these uh, ecosystems around the world, there was about a 90% overlap in what they were doing to create an entrepreneurship ecosystem. So at the end of the day, it's you've got to get the elements, but then you've got to get the coordinating and communicating infrastructure so that you get the leverage from all these parts. The sum has to be more than, the whole has to be more than the sum of the parts. And finally, uh, I'd say the, the, the level of commitment of human and financial resources over a period of time has to be significant enough that you can achieve sustainability. There's a critical mass issue here. If you don't get to a certain threshold, you've got a whole lot of people working like crazy and it just never really comes together. And I think Worcester's a little bit in that position. We've got a lot of really good parts here and really good people. And we're, in a sense, on the verge but if we can just figure out how to get over the hump and create that sustained uh, commitment, that sustainability of an entrepreneurship ecosystem, I think that's going to be a very important start. At the end of the day, though, it does come down to entrepreneurial talent. And the best way we're going to get that is not by sucking people out of Silicon Valley. They're not coming. The best way we're going to do it is to take our homegrown talent and make it so attractive that it stays here or if they are alumni, they come back here because they have such strong ties to the place where they went to college. So with that, I want to congratulate you on passing the pop quiz and uh, turn the floor back to Tim.
Thanks very much, Mark. And, uh, you know, I want to turn it over to the audience for questions, but I, I want to start things off uh, with your number six, which was organizational infrastructure. And I, I think in many ways, Worcester meets a lot of the criteria that you have in, in terms of kind of a dedicated focus, a long-term effort, a uh, commitment uh, at all levels throughout. For us, the struggle has always been, and it was, it was pointed about one of the prior speakers as well, is who's the point of contact and how does that contact work? How are people brought through the system when they, when they reach Worcester? And so I guess the question I'd offer to all the panelists is recognizing that as a community, we're looking to become competitive. What are the roles of the various elements of that community in making that happen? What's the role of government? What's the role of business? What's the role of academia? We've talked about the importance of that. How do you create a unity of purpose or a unity of approach out of what is very much a collective working towards the same goal? Well, I'll, I'll just um, start off with... Uh, um, as I mentioned before, I think that there's a lot that, that needs to be in, in this collaboration. Um, so someone has to take the lead to start to bring the parties together to be able to have those kind of forums where you can, you know, work out, you know, your goals. Where are you going to go? How are you going to get from point A to point B? And as I said, with the kind of resources that you have here, you certainly have an abundance of those. That's not the problem. I think what you have is a lot of silos. You have a lot of people working within their own particular area, be it government or be it, you know, uh, um, higher ed, uh, be it businesses. And there is not really the kind of, uh, of collaboration that you need to have if you really want to build a very strong platform, uh, certainly for the future. So um, it's, it's having someone or some people be able to be the sort of the forum where you can start to evolve a, a new system or you know, somewhat of a better system than that is maybe working anecdotally here and there. Um, so that's, it's, it's not specifically an answer like a, you know, there, here, here or there, it's really setting up a system, I think, which you do need to have if you're going to be growing into the future. Sometimes I think we need translators. I've worked in both, uh, I've worked in academia, government, and uh, business, and the languages are so different than people speak, and the time frames are so uh, different. Uh, in terms of uh, expectations of, of results. Uh, I sit around a table with now 16 CEOs. We just added Vertex Pharmaceuticals CEO, Jeff Lydon, uh, every six to eight weeks for our board meetings. I set an agenda for every meeting. It's never been followed. Uh, <laughs> think about the egos of 16 CEOs from 16 of the largest companies, some of them Fortune 50 companies, uh, and it just goes on. And a lot of it is the frustration with the pace of activity in, um, in government and the circuitous course that must be taken at times to work one's way through that. I don't think it's going to completely change, but the more interaction there is, uh, the better. One of the encouraging things I've seen is all of our members are involved in higher education in some way. They value it highly. They value uh, the talent pool that's being produced. They're uh, doing everything they can to align curricula with what they see as the jobs of the, uh, the time ahead. And by the way, their crystal balls are often cloudy about what those jobs are going to be. Uh, they're not prescient uh, about it uh, as you would think. Uh, they need, it's all moving so fast in the technology, in the biotech, in the big data fields. Uh, that they can't even tell you what are the key uh, qualities and training that employees are going to need in the future. But just to reinforce what David said, the more dialogue, the more connectivity, the more contact, uh, the better off we're all going to be in moving things forward. So I'm going to do a case study here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to do the case study of the other Polytechnic Institute. That's my alma mater, and I don't refer to it by name when I'm at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I think Tim mentioned something about it in, my, in the introduction. But I will tell you that Troy, New York, like, makes Worcester look really good. <laughs> Old industrial city, at least we still have some economic vitality, and we have some companies operating here. Troy, New York is, is pretty much a wasteland when it comes to what we're talking about. I'm not going to do that as the case today. I'm going to do Austin, Texas. 
My wife is a native Texan. I've spent 10 years of my life in Texas. It's a whole nother world, let me tell you. It's a different world, but it's a nice world, but it's a different world. But if you went back, if you went to Austin, Texas in, I'll say the 60s or 70s, and I did, it was a very sleepy, small town. You know, it had a major university and it had state government and it had nothing else. And we don't realize that it's 25 years of commitment that they are now on that list of probably the top five entrepreneurship ecosystems in the country. How did it happen? I think it started with George Kosmetsky. He was a successful business person, a successful entrepreneur who went inside the university. And for a time, he was the president of UT Austin. Uh, when I met him, he was the uh, former dean of the business school. He'd served both of those roles, but he was a force of nature. Uh, and so what did he do? He founded the IC Squared Institute. Uh, I'm never going to remember the acronym, but it's uh, uh, Innovation, Creativity, and Capital or something like that. Uh, it was the sort of the organizing uh, starting point for their entrepreneurship ecosystem. From that, they started the Austin Technology Incubator. It won Incubator of the Year uh, a few years after my incubator did. Very successful incubator. Uh, Laura Kilcrease was the driver of that, phenomenal leader. She left that to form uh, the Venture Capital Network in uh, Texas. Extensive across the state with some very strong venture funds in uh, Austin itself. Ray Smiler was the, uh, at the time, the head of the IC Squared Institute. Uh, he was the one who brought the university uh, and the students into the process. He also created a regional know-how network. You know, one of the interesting things in Texas is you don't have this sort of collection of small towns and cities. It, the way it works is when a city grows, it just keeps expanding its boundaries. So my wife is from Corpus Christi, Texas. It's about 300,000 people. There's one chamber of commerce. I was born in Albany, New York. There's the Albany Chamber, the Troy Chamber, the Saratoga Chamber, the Schenectady Chamber, and a whole lot of other chambers. So the Northeast tends to have this problem of how do we get the pieces together. But if we start to look at some of the really great success stories and start to sense for what, what was it that they did, I think the pattern becomes relatively clear. And the key thing is to start with something and focus on it. So I, I'm a big fan, of, particularly as a person who has engineering degrees, do the pilot project. You know, what is the one thing we could decide over the next couple of years to collaborate on and get the government and the acad academic leadership and the business leadership and say, okay, we're going to do one thing. We're going to do one thing really well, figure out how to work together, then do the second, then do the third. Thank you. Open it up to the floor. Yep. Hi. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the reoccurring theme uh, coming up tonight about the need to embrace our colleges and um, to, to focus on uh, quality of life in order to you know, uh, retain a, an educated workforce as an approach to economic development. Um, un unfortunately, a lot of our public deliberation seems to be focused on you know, creating hockey rinks for downtown or you know, uh, casinos for economic development. And um, so I wonder if, is there, what, what should that one project be? You know, do you think, uh, what are some specifics that you guys are thinking about? Should it be through better urban planning practice, walkable city? Should it be through, you know, the redevelopment of the canal? Should it be through um, creating a, a vibrant downtown, rich in, um, you know, uh, uh, creative uh, amenities, uh, cultural amenities, that sort of thing? Is it through embracing locally owned and independent businesses? So yes. I want to open up to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really liked David's idea about this, uh, you know, creating a place where all the college students can come together and share ideas. I wonder if we could create a discussion about some of these more specifics that we should be focused on rather than casinos and, and that sort of thing. Um, I, I really think you have to be careful about um, sitting in a room and saying, you know what, this is what we, um, this is going to be work, this is going to be great, we should do this. Um, and then that's going to work. I think it has to be much more organic, uh, especially if you're dealing with, which I think to be, you know, a, if you want to talk about a project, the idea of being able to create some kind of community for, you know, the younger, um, you know, college students, graduates, um, especially, you know, graduates, which are, you know, already starting to make a move out. 
Um, but that really requires working with them and, and, and trying to work and establish what comes out of that. Um, I could sort of say, well, you know what, if you put downtown, you know, uh, a facility here which has a good restaurant and has, you know, this and this, and you get some shuttle buses from the colleges, well, that's wonderful, except that's my idea of what is going to work there. I think you need to really do the homework and have to work with the, the population that you have there and try to figure out what is it going to be that is going to be value added to them. What is going to attract them to stay here, to, uh, uh, to, enjoy, you know, to enjoy the city of Worcester more than just being a campus that they spend their whole you know, four years? Um, so I think it, it has to be much more of an organic process as opposed to a top-down, uh, because otherwise you end up creating something and, as again, that build it and will they come? Well, they don't come and where do we go wrong on that? By the way, one quick comment. I, can't resist it on Austin. One of the things that happens when you, you know, have a business that's coming into Austin, they're met at the airport, usually by someone from you know, the governor's office or whatever, or whatever along with probably uh, three deans or college presidents who are meeting with that uh, entrepreneur right off the bat. That relationship is established right from the start. We don't have that here. Uh, that, again, is something that Worcester has an opportunity to participate in but it doesn't have that ability to connect into that whole economic process. Just a quick aside. Uh, uh, I agree with David that um, these kind of centers of activity have to develop organically, but I'm big on downtown Worcester. I think the breakthrough from City Hall to the train station, tearing down that part of that ugly garage uh, the city square project is major and needs to be built upon further uh, and doing everything and this is where the business community can play a big role in making bringing back Main Street bringing back uh, the downtown restaurants clubs you know Austin the music scene is uh, is everywhere and that, that's what keeps people in the city in the evenings um, Anything that could be do, done to encourage that government can make it easier from a zoning perspective, perhaps easier from a licensing perspective. Uh, take away the barriers and see what might emerge. And I think the students will be drawn and at least give it a try. Next question. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I do have something to say on that if I can. No, uh, jump in. Jump in. Sorry. Um, so just, just to be contentious, I'm going to agree and disagree with my two uh, buddies here. And it's the organic versus leadership thing. Uh, you know, you'd ask the question, given we have what we have here, a lot of resources, smart people, dedicated people, I mean, really good people in Worcester. Well, well what, what, why aren't we where we want to be? You know, what's, what is holding us back? So I would argue that we need to continue to do the things in the silos that create value. You know, somebody's got to work on downtown and somebody's got to work on infrastructure and the tax rates and all that kind of stuff. Th those things have to continue to happen in a sort of a more local sense. But the real issue is from a regional sense, what do we start to do that builds the sense of collaboration and coordination and communication, by the way? And it's got to add up to 1 plus 1 adds up to 10. You know, if 1 plus 1 adds up to 1 and a half, people get frustrated, it's inefficient, and they got better things to do with their time. So uh, l let me give a specific example that I think will answer your question. You know, WPI is well known for project-based learning. We've been doing it for 40 years, the WPI plan. We do it really, really well. Uh, I heard the statistics uh, in the last week. 300 student projects <coughs> focused on their uh, majors. So it's called the major qualifying project. 300 projects a year. So what do we do? They do a great project. They write up a report. The report goes in some shelf or some electronic shelf. And then they go take a great job in industry someplace else. So as the guy who's thinking entrepreneurially, I'm going 300 projects. Come on, 10% of them have got to have commercial potential. Why aren't we asking those students when they finish those projects, if you think this might have commercial potential, why don't you hang around here for six months and give it a try? The job can wait six months. So for that reason, a year ago, we, cr we created a network of uh, serial entrepreneurs and investors, most of them connected to WPI, but not all. Some are just friends of the community. Uh, it's called the Tech Advisor Network. It's a virtual incubator. 
Uh, we've had 16 innovators and entrepreneurs go through the program right so far. It's a test. Can we do this? And I can tell you that there is a group that draws on government and business and the educational institutions here that for a year has been talking about doing a regional incubator. Now, it doesn't have to be that. That happens to be something I know a lot about and I'm passionate about. Maybe it's something else. But there needs to be something that causes us to figure out how to collaborate in a way where one plus one adds up to 10. David, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, I agree with you 100% that to create demand, that's how you're going to get companies to come here. And creating demand through a workforce where companies want to put their business here and be close to that workforce. And we talked about the collaboration with the colleges, and get, but uh, what, would, what advice would you get to Worcester about our K through 12? You know, we have an urban school district, and with urban school districts face all sorts of issues, but to get the folks that would tend to maybe live here after they go to high school and college, because they are from here. But, uh, you know, uh, Quinn Sigmund, Gail's doing some wonderful work getting that workforce ready, but she's spending probably the first year teaching people how to read and write. So, you know, what, what, that's a big challenge and a big opportunity, but what would you tell us here about our K-12? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. Um, it, you know, it used to be that if you were talking about uh, business development, um, we'd all be talking about uh, tax incentives, we'd all be talking about uh, ease of permitting, and that's really where it's focused. Um, I think this panel here will be wholly supportive of saying probably the mo most important element in any municipality or any region is education and it starts right from the bottom, uh, right from you know, K through 12. And if that doesn't start off on the right track, um, forget everything else. I mean, that is the co cornerstone. So I really have, I'm, I'm, I'm naive. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to ask a question which I don't understand the answer to. Um, so I'll throw it back at you. Um, I understand that there's a school um, in uh, near Clark, as a matter of fact, the uh, 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 Park Cell. University Park. Park. Hmm? Right. And um, so they work, or they get, um, it's, it's by lottery, it's all coming from that one particular area, which is, you know, somewhat, somewhat a depressed area as compared to other parts of Worcester. Um, so there's no great, um, you know, cream of the crop that they're selecting. And it's a 7th through 12th grade um, that they go through that. And over the last, what, three, four years that they've had the full graduation uh, group that has gone through the whole system, from what I understand, 100%, 100% have gone on to college. Now, I'm confused by something. If that's a system that, that worked there, why isn't it throughout Worcester? Am I missing something here? And I'm sure that there are a lot of reasons, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it in other parts of the state where you have some very innovative schools that are having tremendous results. I don't get it, okay? If you have some answers, why aren't they being applied? Where, the, where is the pressure coming from the parents saying, you know, they sort of, uh, uh, I want what they're having kind of thing. So I, I'm a little confused by it. Um, if we have answers that are proving out that it may not be the kid, okay? We always say, well, you know, they come from a uh, single parent, they see, you know, English second language, you know, well, you know we're not, we can't do anything with them. Well, here's a case that shows that you can, so maybe it isn't the kids, maybe it's the system. So um, I, that's not the answer, it's the question. Our group has, among the priorities that it is focused on, has made education and workforce training the top priority. And it's headed by Bill Swanson, who's the CEO of Raytheon. And he's dedicated a significant portion of his time to education issues, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, and it's for selfish reasons. He needs more engineers at, at Raytheon, and uh, uh, he wants to see a, a better pipeline coming up. So we become involved in a program called Pathways to Prosperity. It's a pilot. It's with, right now, we're working with um, uh, Bunker Hill and Mass Bay Community College, and we reach down into the high school. It's a six-year program starting freshman year in high school, and we're trying to assist those students in preparing for careers, starting out in ninth grade. And um, the community colleges are sending faculty into the high schools to try to lessen that remedial uh, piece that you talk about. The reason our graduation rates aren't 
what we would want them to be from community colleges. A lot of reasons, there's some economic reasons, non-traditional students, but part of it is how much remedial work has to be done. How much Gale has to concentrate on getting them ready for the community college curriculum. So this program is designed to reach down and try to narrow that remedial gap and bring them in a little better prepared. But I was talking to Bill Swanson the other day about where do we go from here, and he said we have to reach down even further. Uh, young women make decisions that they don't like science and math in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and we lose half of our potential uh, uh, pipeline uh, at that point. So Bill is uh, coming up with some initiatives to focus our group on reaching back even further to try to introduce people to what education is going to mean to them. Uh, what are the opportunities that are, they're going to see if they continue on this pathway? Um, what kind of training uh, coursework will lead them in directions that uh, they may find fascinating? And I think our role in business is to uh, become more involved in the school system at an earlier stage. I thought you would think a slots parlor in Silicon Valley would be a great idea. <laughs> Since I, I have, this is probably, I can speculate because I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, but I will say, particularly for my WPI friends that are in this room, that, uh, you know, not being critical, be, I'm reporting what I've been told. Worcester, its institutions, WPI, tend to live in a bubble. It's, it's sort of an insular, isolated, sort of, for whatever reason. I, don't, I think there's a lot of history there from what I hear. But I keep saying, this goes to your point about schools that work, hey, there are regions that work. And so if I were in charge of good government for Massachusetts and uh, had the resources, I'd say take a delegation, not to China and not to Israel, take a delegation to the most successful sort of regional uh, pla places that are somewhat similar to Worcester. You know, it's not New York City or Chicago, right? But it's the second largest city in New England. Take, take the team to other places and go ask the questions. You know, what have you done over the last two decades that have made Austin so successful or uh, Raleigh so successful or, uh, you know, Denver, Boulder, uh, you know, that, that part of the country? You know, it's not Silicon Valley, frankly. You've got to go to the places that are more similar to Worcester and say, well, what have you done to be successful? Maybe that opens people's eyes. I don't know. That would be the thing I would do. This um, town gown issue is, I, I grew up in East Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it's been an issue all my life uh, uh, there. And in, in that city, there are two fairly wealthy institutions as uh, academic institutions go, so that exacerbates it a bit too. I think where the universities and colleges have uh, 
failed in helping to solve this political issue of um, meeting their fair share to support the services is they haven't done enough to talk about what they are doing. And maybe they've been too much in the bubble and haven't reached out to their su surrounding communities as much as they should have. Clark's work in the schools, public schools, is an example of the right way to do it. Um, but when I think of all the pluses that are going on in our colleges and universities, uh, uh, what WPI does to create new entrepreneurs in robotics and biotech and cutting edge areas, um, it, there has to be a way to get that message across and for people to understand that having these institutions as part of the community is good for the uh, sons and daughters of those taxpayers who are um, paying those property taxes and that there's real value for Worcester in doing it. So more communication, uh, and a little bit of breaking out of the bubble, probably, by the academic institutions. Hi. Um, earlier this month, CEO Magazine, well, we spent a lot of talk today about Texas. CEO Magazine mentioned that Texas was the number one state to do business in, in Massachusetts was 47. And it, a lot of that might have to do with taxes, et cetera, that you've already talked about. But I was wondering if you could make a few observations about how that impacts us. So what should I do is my wife is a Texan. <laughs> Every place has its pluses and minuses, right? Let me tell you, there's some things in Texas we would not want to have here. You know, very low commitment to uh, education. Uh, I have a, we have a candidate for a job here who's currently in Texas who says that you know, it has, it has a phenomenal state university system. They've invested huge amounts of oil revenues in building this great university system. Their governor has declared, ah, forget research, we're gonna turn them all into teaching institutions. Nothing wrong with teaching, don't get me wrong. But universities as generators of intellectual property that then become the basis of new companies, come on, you're gonna cut that right off? So they have, they have their issues in Texas. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, without a doubt, uh, they are a, you know, full speed ahead, uh, damn the torpedoes, uh, who cares about the environment, uh, who cares about the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, they'll figure out how to survive in some way or another. Uh, and you know the tax situation, right? There's no state income tax. Uh, and do you know that the legislature meets every other year? <laughs> Yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I think is a good thing, okay? So, uh, you know, look, every place has its plus and minus, but clearly Texas is a, a very strong economy at this point. I think uh, I remember a line from Urban Cowboy, Texas has oil and all that implies. <laughs> and I think that uh, um, that uh, revenue stream has been very valuable to uh, making it easier to have the burden on individual uh, taxpayers and corporate taxpayers be less. I see um, what some of the companies in our um, organization have located facilities in Texas. Uh, and they've located facilities there um, because of some very strong incentives uh, provided by the uh, state of Texas. But the kind of facilities they're locating there aren't talent-oriented facilities. Uh, they're call centers. Uh, they're the uh, uh, less, uh, lower salary, uh, less training positions. Important to have those positions in, in, in Massachusetts as well. Um, but when it comes to the need for talent, innovation, development of that new product line, uh, what it does big data mean uh, for the future and how can we capture it here, um, the talent is here. and those kinds of activities are happening here. All of Fidelity's research activities uh, go on in uh, Ma Massachusetts, all of their development of new products. But they do have a facility in Texas, and I've got to tell you about this one. If you um, have 25 uh, head of cattle on your land, you uh, qualify as an agricultural use. So Ned Johnson, uh, chairman and CEO of, uh, of Fidelity, bought 25 head of cattle and they graze around the call center in Texas. Uh, <laughs> now that's, 
it's a little bit, uh, I think, going a bit far in terms of uh, incentives and uh, distorting uh, the marketplace. Uh, Austin is, a, is an exception. It's an island in Texas of um, uh, innovation and entrepreneurial activity, but it's an island. Uh, uh, the rest of the state, I think, it would not be a place that we'd be that anxious in relocating to with our families. I think Worcester has a lot more to offer. I just want to point out there are, uh, just be, always be careful when you read these surveys. Um, today, you're, you're 47th, tomorrow, in another study, you're third. Um, you know, I remember reading that particular study and I, that part of the reason that they gave it low was that the governor had proposed uh, increased tax, proposed increasing taxes for a, a very, very major capital expenditure for transportation and education. How do you possibly grade a state based on a proposal as opposed to what is reality? So these are all political and there's a lot of things behind these studies and you'll see, I mean, we always love it when we come up on top, but you know, this. One should be very careful um, with what you read as far as any kind of surveys that are out there. Sort of like the US, uh, you know, the, uh, the front of the page, what is it, the uh, you know, USA Today, you know, the kind of thing. You know, everyone likes to read those, but there's not a lot of value behind them. Good morning. Uh, a statement was made early, earlier uh, along the lines of beware of the philosophy of build it and they will come. Uh, can any of you elaborate on that, whether you see that happening in Worcester or whether you have examples in other communities of, of that occurring uh, to its, in a bad way? Uh, um, maybe this is a sensitive topic, but um, City Square, um, you know, when the de developer came in and made a proposal for it, uh, everyone expected that he was going to start tomorrow and, you know, build an office building and build this and, you know, and. But the reality is, uh, and the same thing, by the way, with the, the city of Boston, the mayor had uh, with the Filene site, um, you know, the market is going to drive it, okay? You can't just all of a sudden create a space and say that's going to work. Um, the Filene's building uh, site is going to happen um, with this new developer, but it probably at the same time it would have happened with the older developer. Um, it's a question of when the market is there and when you can move forward. So you can have plans, and I think it's very important to do that kind of planning and envisioning. But the reality is that you have to have the use, you have to have the demand there to actually then be able to build it. You can't just assume that someone's going to, as the mayor in Boston said to uh, Vernado, well, why don't you just build the building? You have the money. You can just build the office building. You promised it. And of course, if they had done that, uh, it would be sitting empty, and they'd be losing you know, their shirt on it there. Um, the market is the driver of that, and what's behind the market is, of course, the demand side, and is there a demand for it at what kind of price? So, not quite answering it, but I, I do think that's what you have to look at very carefully. It's not just a matter of saying, we've planned for, you know, a 50-story building here, um, who's going to build it? Uh, more of the question is, is there a demand for whatever it is, a 10-story, is there a demand for this amount of space um, in the marketplace at the, this kind of pricing? And if there isn't, it's not going to happen. Support, state support for public higher education has been abysmal for more than a decade. Um, governor stepped up this year with his budget proposal. House stepped up. Not so much. The Senate raised the needs yet. Um, you know, it's a very expensive proposition for middle class families now to send their kids to private colleges. Public higher education is more important than ever. We press, we lobby, we are the voice. You know, uh, inside Boston last year, um, corporations stepped up on the community college issue in particular. And still, we're in an uphill climb for resources, even though those resources are supposed to be performance based. And we embrace that uh, as presidents. I would be interested in any advice and counsel that uh, I can hear on how to move the needle on that. So we work uh, closely with the community college leadership and uh, Commissioner of Higher Education. Our group feels that public higher education is the best economic development investment that you can make in the Commonwealth. Um, our public uh, higher education institutions have an incredible track record of 
uh, the students who graduate staying here in the Commonwealth, much higher than the private institutions. Uh, so we supported the reforms uh, and the performance-based funding of community colleges and advocated uh, with the governor and the legislature for increased funding. The governor came through, um, the House came through, as uh, Dr. Carberry says, uh, and um, Senator Michael Moore, who's a senator from this area, has offered amendments in the Senate to bring the funding back up to the level it should be, uh, as in particular for the community colleges. I think they're under debate right now, uh, maybe today. We, our group, are going to continue to meet with the uh, conferees and concentrate on the House side, uh, Chairman uh, Brian Dempsey, Chairman of Ways and Means, and urge them to dig in their heels and prevail in the conference because we think that investment in higher education absolutely needs to be made. Uh, these are difficult budget times. We're seeing a little bit of uh, uh, additional revenue uh, coming in because the economy is coming back. Uh, and we want to see as much of those uh, new dollars invested in public, public higher education as possible. It's our it's really our, our top priority. The governor also proposed uh, a significant investment in preschool and pre-K. Uh, and um, it just, uh, when we had to prioritize the two, we went with the public higher education side of it. Uh, but I think uh, we're going to have to watch that as well, uh, uh, the pre-K investment. If monies do become available, uh, if the economy continues to come back, if people are back at work and paying their taxes happily because they have a job, maybe not happily, but with resolve, uh, then uh, I think that's another education area where more dollars are going to be necessary. Higher education is not uniform. There's a wide spectrum of stuff. However, I, I'll make a general statement that I'm sure doesn't apply to you. Uh, I tell my students all the time that the least well-managed parts of our economy, in no particular order, are government, health care, and higher education. So yes, the funding is critical, and, and it's a sort of a commitment to the, to the most critical resource, the human talent, you know, funding for education. That said, uh, we're all going to have to figure out how to do a better job of, of where's the real value that we deliver focus the resources there, make choices about what we don't do because it's low value added activity. Uh, one of the conversations we have here is about, think of this as a four quadrant uh, uh, matrix, a matrix uh, where one dimension is uh, strategically important, high value added, and the other is uh, uh, revenue generating. So there's a quadrant where it's strategically important, high value added, and it's revenue generating. Boy, those things ought to get really a lot of focus from the leadership in either any of those four, three sectors, by the way, but higher education in particular. How about if it's strategic but it loses you money, creates high value? Well, that's where you make investments because it's critically important. Uh, how about where it's not so strategic but it generates resources? Hey, keep it going because it's going to fund those other things. And then there's that quadrant of things that we keep doing because we've done them forever where they're not strategic, they don't add a lot of value, and they suck cash. I think, you know, as leaders of educational institutions, healthcare institutions, and government, we have to make choices. This goes back to prioritizing. We've got to make choices about where do we get the biggest return on investment for the investments we commit. Uh, if I could end it with one last question, and Dan, I'm going to violate your rule for a minute. But um, recognizing we're, we're uh, all appreciative of the Patrick Murray administration. We've had a great relationship with the state under your tenure as secretary and under Greg Bialecki's tenure as secretary since. Um, just as we look at the lieutenant governor coming back to Worcester, how do we maintain a seat at the table uh, in terms of broad-based decision-making in Massachusetts and beyond, both from a government perspective, a real estate perspective, and a business perspective? How do we keep this trend moving forward? I think um, your track record is impressive and uh, has been noted uh, on Beacon Hill. You, uh, when you have been given resources, you've used them uh, very effectively here in Worcester, Gateway Research Park, um, 
the infrastructure investments in City Square, business stepping up like Unum did to uh, you know, create the demand um, uh, for very small incremental incentives from government, uh, which I was able to be part of uh, putting together. Um, it was the business, it was that business with its roots in Worcester that really made that project go. So I think the track record will serve you well, whoever is uh, in the leadership position in, uh, in, uh, in Boston and Beacon Hill and state government. Um, and I'd urge you to keep that uh, going. Uh, the city manager, manager form of government um, works here. It works very well in uh, Springfield. Uh, the long tenure of Mike O'Brien, a good relationship with the council and, and the mayors, uh, that too is noted and um, I think makes it more likely that the pipeline will continue to flow uh, in Worcester's direction because of how effective, uh, effectively you've used the resources that uh, have been made available. Um, I think you've got to be prepared to do um, more with less. Um, I disagree a little bit with Dan. I think that you look at the budgets going forward. Um, we're still reliant upon one-time um, uh, you know, revenue uh, elements, um, and we are not out of the woods at all for, for a number of years to come. So I think that um, I would not be as optimistic about having uh, increased monies coming. I think you know, maintaining what you have is going to be tough. I think you're going to have to be looking, uh, look, you know, at yourself and sort of say, what can we do and do it better with uh, more efficiently, and to follow up with the college universities. Um, I, it's the negative part. Uh, I just think that the uh, current model uh, for higher ed is totally unsustainable. Um, it used to be that we talk about kids going, you know, the first year, this years ago. Look to your right, look to your left, and one of you is not going to be here. Colleges, universities, look to your right, look to your left. One of you is not going to be here. Um, you can't sustain the kind of price increases that are going on, the increasing of staffing, the increasing of the costs, and putting it all onto tuition. Um, just not going to work. So there's a real ser a serious structural problem out there, not to finish off on a negative. But um, I think economics going forward, um, we're not out of this. Uh, we have a lot of serious problems ahead of us economically, which means that we're going to have to do a heck of a lot of better job um, to hold on to what we have. I, I want to thank our speakers, um, uh, Dan O'Connell, David Begelfer, Mark Rice. Uh, I thank you all for coming. Our sponsors, uh, Commerce Bank and Polar Beverages and the Worcester Regional Research Bureau. WPI for hosting. Thanks very much. <laughs>